Holy God, let my words be your words, and when my words are not your words, let your people be wise enough to know the same. Amen. Amen. Our presiding bishop, uh, the most Reverend Michael B. Curry has popularized a phrase about God that I bet a lot of you know. If it's not about love, it's not about God, right? If it's not about love, it's not about God. Well, this is an example of a very old method of talking about God. It's called apophatic theology. Apophatic theology. There's your, uh, your word that you can take to your next cocktail party. And now we're going to talk about what it actually means. Apophatic theology is speaking not in positive statements about God, but, which would be something like God is good, but instead saying only those things which we know do not pertain to the perfectness of God. That is apophatic theology. Now, using this method, I want to talk about Jesus, who is our good shepherd, and this is Good Shepherd Sunday. However, I want us to be a little creative on this rainy, sleepy morning and use our theological imagination. So today I want us to dream about our Good Shepherd Jesus, not as a first century paragon of spiritually guiding us as sheep, not even as a modern day pastor who might care and tend for the flock, but instead, I want to do the complete opposite. And to do this, I want to draw upon the modern prophet, David Letterman. <laughs> and I want to tell you the top 10 reasons one might be a bad shepherd instead of a good shepherd, all right? These are the top 10 reasons that someone might be a bad shepherd, all right? And we're gonna use this kind of profession of being a pastor to describe this. So, number 10. The number 10 reason that one might be a bad shepherd is by starting, or the number 10 reason why one might be a bad shepherd is by starting every vestry meeting with 30 minutes of silent meditation. <laughs> that might be the one way to be a bad shepherd, all right? Another way that one might be a bad shepherd, number nine, is saying to a grieving family in the hospital, I'm sorry, but I cannot do the funeral at that time because my fantasy football team is playing. <laughs> number eight, number eight, teaching an Augustine of Hippo Christian education class entitled My Confessions, the true life tales of a pastor before he met Jesus. <laughs> number seven, number seven way that one might be a bad shepherd is by forgetting your microphone is hot when you start having an argument with yourself out loud about who is the greatest parishioner. Not a good, <laughs> not a good thing to do. Not a good thing to do. All right, number six, number six on the ways of being a bad shepherd. Instead of using our beloved book of common prayer, siding with a bridezilla's desire to write her own vows, which include a line about how her husband will spend every Monday night watching ABC's The Golden Bachelor with her. It's the number six reason. Number five, number five way of being a bad shepherd is by wearing a purple bishop's shirt around your house and insisting that your family call you the Bishop of Narnia. <laughs> not, a good, not a good look. Number four, number four, and this is a biggie. This is a, a big way of not being a good shepherd is by doing anything to upset the Episcopal Mafia. I mean the altar guild. <laughs> they run the church, they run the church. Number three. Number three way to be a bad shepherd is by starting and ending every sermon with the catch-all prayer, Roll Tide, <laughs> or, or War Eagle. Does not work, does not work. All right, the number two reason, the number two reason 
one might be a bad shepherd, is by using the clergy discretionary fund to go on a shopping spree for unnecessary cl clergy apparel, right? That would not be a good thing to do. All right, and the number one way to be a bad shepherd is, well, I'm going to make you wait a little bit for that one, all right? All right, as funny as some of these are, and they are kind of funny, there's a sad kernel of truth that runs through all of them. Hidden in the background of our gospel lesson for today, the 10th chapter of John, which is about the good shepherd, are some words from the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel and Jesus were concerned not only with describing God as a good shepherd, but also with the apophatic practice of pointing out the bad shepherds too. As Ezekiel described them, these were shepherds who had not strengthened the weak, healed the sick, bound up the injured, brought back the strayed, sought the lost, but with force and harshness had ruled them. Bad shepherds, sadly enough, are not characters confined to ages past or ancient history. Painfully, we know examples that are not old, but are recent. Painfully, we know examples that are not humorous, but heart-wrenching. We can think of church leaders who have been harmful. They have been teachers who have caused pain. They have been priests who violated our trust and pastors who have scattered the flock. We might wonder why this happens. The reason I think it happens uh, is briefly explained by a thinker named Parker Palmer, uh, who's a Quaker thinker and author, and he has this great little book called Let Your Life Speak. And he borrows a line from the Sufi mystic Rumi that surgically cuts to a deep and painful truth, a truth that gets at answering the question that I just asked. If you are here unfaithfully with us, you are causing terrible damage. And then Parker adds on, if we are unfaithful to our true self, we will extract a price from others. We will make promises that we cannot keep, build houses with flimsy material, conjure dreams that devolve into nightmares, and other people will suffer if we are unfaithful to our true self. This is an apophatic description of the Good Shepherd. Now, here's how we might say it more positively. The good shepherd gives to others. The good shepherd keeps promises. The good shepherd builds houses that last. The good shepherd conjures dreams that grow. The good shepherd takes away suffering. The good shepherd is faithful. These words are so beautiful. And yet sometimes in the church, we get things all mixed up. As your pastor, I am called to not be the bad shepherd. I am called to not be the hired hand. But I am also not called to be the good shepherd. Now we are getting closer to the number one way to be a bad shepherd, but first I want to clarify something. What we mean by the word good. The Greek word that we assume means good doesn't authentically translate as how we commonly use it. A quality to be desired or approved of, that definition of good. The original word here, kalos in the Greek, means model or example. So the model shepherd. Jesus is the exemplary shepherd for us to follow. The one we are to go in the way of, which gets us to numero uno on the list. The number one thing that makes a church leader into a bad shepherd is the thinking that we are the good shepherd. I am not the good shepherd, and I don't think any of us are individually the good shepherd. However, to clarify this point, I need to rely upon a great classic movie, a movie called Home Alone. Perhaps you've seen it. Now, you may recall in that film that Kevin McAllister is left home alone. That's the title of the movie, right? So Kevin survives pretty well on his own for a few days, right? until he gets to Christmas Eve and realizes that he is very much missing his family. And so he goes in search of a mall Santa 
and he finds that mall Santa with his beard off of his face and smoking a cigarette on Christmas Eve. And he says to him, I know you're not the real Santa, but I also know that you work for him. I know that you're not the real Santa, but I know that you work for him. This mall Santa, that's my part, and that's your part too. You are not the real good shepherd, but you work for the guy. I am not the good shepherd, but I work for the guy. Now this week, we had a vestry meeting in which everyone seemed to think it was really funny that I kept pointing out the celebration of new ministry that we're having on May 1st. They kept saying that it was like my grand event that was about to happen. But the truth is, this is not my grand event. Lionel Mitchell, the liturgical theologian who wrote this beautiful commentary on the Book of Common Prayer, makes it clear that holy moments like ordinations or celebrations of new ministry are not coronations for clergy. No, they are celebrations of our ministry together as this part of the body of Christ. That's so important for us to keep at the forefront of our minds. We are all part of the ministry of the Good Shepherd, which means all of us are called to follow the example of our model shepherd, Jesus. All of us are to do those things that Ezekiel and Jesus laid out that I was talking about earlier. All of us are called to strengthen the weak, heal the sick, bind up the injured, bring back the strayed, and seek the lost. All of us are called to give to others, to keep promises that we make, to build houses that last, to conjure dreams that grow, to take away suffering, and to remain ever faithful. All of us are called to follow our model shepherd. Beloveds, this means that though we be people with an unclean lips, we say to God, here am I, send me. This means that we go with our exemplary shepherd even into the valley of the shadow of death so that we might draw others into the life of Christ. This means that we protect the vulnerable lambs, feed the hungry sheep, and go in search of any lost members of the flock. This means that we follow our model shepherd even in laying down our lives for one another. For there is no greater love than this, and we would lay down our lives for one another. So may we remember who we are and also whose we are. We follow an exemplary shepherd. Let us follow in Christ's way of love. For if it isn't about love, it isn't about God. Amen.